Hello, everyone. Um, so this talk is, is yet another reminder that tests the code and need care and, fe care and feeding as well. Um, and it describes uh, a spike that we ran on a, on a rather messy, complex um, Go project uh, to make the integration tests faster and a bit more readable. Um, it happens to be written in Go, but Go is not the point, um, although it's, th there's some interesting things around that. Uh, show of hands, how many people are actually familiar with Go to any extent? So a medium chunk. Okay. Um, we also learned that, as you, the, the twist at the end is that we learned that teams have to go at the speed they can go. Um, they have their house style, and you have to fit in with it to some extent. Um, I would point out that there's a lot of code in this talk, um, and we tried to bring the projectors up a bit. Um, the best I can say is just relax, just look at the patterns, don't worry about it, don't get sucked into the detail. Um, the whole team was involved in this at some point, but it was, most of the work was done with Winner Bridgewater, who, who can't be here today, um, and, and me. Um, it's slightly complicated. I, I work, uh, this is done at, P at Pivotal. Um, I, I have sort of two, two parts to my life. One is with Zorker Engineering, we're recruiting. Um, and the other is my personal company, which is Higher Order Logic. So this was done by Higher, Higher Order Logic. Um, so the first complexity, so take a deep breath, just relax. Here's the cast of characters. Um, and I, uh, the reason to explain all this is because otherwise some of the bits don't, don't quite make sense. Um, so we're building extensions or things for Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is the pivotal um, cloud platform. Um, there's a tool called Bosch, which is a tool for release engineering, where you declaratively declare all the bits and pieces that you need to release, and then it figures out what to do. It's, uh, shall we say, a steep learning curve. I only got that far up the foothills, um, but it is a bit relevant. Um, it was actually, apparently, the work was actually originally done by people who'd done this work at Google, and it sort of embodied their, their experience of doing, doing this kind of work at scale. Um, there's a service broker, which is, as you'd expect, is a broker that brokers services, but it's a catalog of service offerings and it does provisioning and all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing we're actually working on is a new tool called, called an on-demand service broker. And the idea is that if a service gets particularly busy, you can spin up some new instances without having to do it by hand or explicitly. To make that work, because you've got all your brokers, um, the brokers have to know what to do to make the service work. And so there's this thing called a service adapter, which is an executable that on request will generate the Bosch control structures. Um, and the reason it's an executable is because you don't know what language your service is written in. So best make it a script or an executable, executable which, which means you need to run a subshell. And then at the bottom, uh, there's this test framework um, there's Ginkgo and GoMega, which is a test and a matcher framework uh, written in Go. We're strongly inspired by RSpec, if that people are familiar with that. Um, so that's the cast of characters. Here's the first question. How do you test the on-demand broker? Um, I'll go this side to this time. You, you, I'll do you a lot later. Um, so in the middle of this, there's um, actually, maybe I'll use the pointer thing. See if I can get that to work. E mouse, Let's, uh, mouse, yes. All right. In the middle of this is the on-demand broker. Is the the on-demand broker, and if you can see, this, it calls the service adapter that will in eventually um, ask Clam Foundry to create an instance via Bosch, or uh, it's all a bit vague, um, and then spin something up on, on a on a worker VM. Um, it's not a terribly helpful thing, but what it does give you is a sense that there are lots and lots of moving parts. Um, and the complexity is that this service adapter stub, the service adapter runs in a subshell. So the test that we inherited, um, the way they, they, they made this work, is you would put stubbed responses and expectations in the shell environment, and then that would sort of export through down to the subshell. Um, the rest of it was fairly standard. You set it with mocks and stubs and um, expectations and, 
and, and return values, and then you fire the event. And that's all, that's kind of, the, 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 this, this is a little bit relevant. This, this, uh, some of this will come up, will come up later. So when I turned up, a lot of the integration tests looked like this. Uh, and I'll just sort of walk it through. Um, on this side, there's a before suite, which compiles and builds all the binaries. And there's a reason for that we'll come to later. I have to do it from here. There's a, so here's our first context. So this is the sort of aspect context -y thing. Uh, we're updating a service instance. So you set up all the collaborators. And just before each, you start the brokers. Uh, broke up. And then here's another context as you're switching plans. So that's the context we're looking at, the uh, sort of deployment plan. Um, before each, you set up the manifest, so what you're expecting to get back. You t you're going to tell the manifest, the stub adapter, to return this example manifest. Um, so that's the stub response. And here's the condition that there are no pending changes, so it just runs, flows through. Just before each, you set up a bunch of interactions. And then you assert, in this case, the HTTP status code. Um, and then you assert some other things. You assert something about response and some various other, other assertions. Um, these turn out to be slow and brittle. Firstly, there's a lot of it. Um, this is a compact version with lots of stuff hidden in there. This is just like the, the headlines. There's, in this particular file, there are about 970 lines, and there are other files as well. So that's a lot of uh, just text to get through. And if you think of uh, Michael's point about that, the, that we tend to read at the same speed. So that's an awful lot of reading just to find out what's going on. There's this flow of control between the before each and the just before each, um, which to this day I'm not entirely certain what happens. Um, I think what happens is there's a pass through with all the before each, and then there's another pass through with the just before each. Um, but we spent, uh, I spent, certainly spent a lot of time going up and down trying to figure out when things were called and when things are, uh, happened. And in particular because um, some of the test code used values that were set at various stages and then used later on. So there was a certain amount of pretending to be the, um, the test framework to figure out where a value might come from. Um, more interestingly, and this is fine for unit tests, but it's really not what you want for integration tests, each of these clauses these are the it clauses, if you're familiar with the, um, if you're familiar with the frameworks. Uh, each of these triggers an entire run all the way from the top down. Maybe not the sweet run, but all the rest of it. So it starts the broker, sets up all the subshells, blah, 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 for each one of these bits of detail. Um, and more subtly, each one of these bits of detail tells you something that you're asserting, but not why. It doesn't really give you a... It's actually missing a context, if you like, here, is that what's the point? Um, so that's the sort of the top level view. Now, if you look at, you take one of these, if you take this, includes the operation data in the response. Um, so that's what this actually looked like. Here's the assertion clause, more or less visible. Um, there's a certain amount of repetition. So, in Go, they've got this premise that the only way to make sure people handle errors is to return them and make sure that you can't, you can't just ignore them. And so the, the in Go, you see an awful lot of this sort of thing, which is you get two values back. One is the error code, and then you have to check the error code. Uh, we were using the Ginkgo assertions just to, just to short circuit. Um, but all of this stuff from there down to there is getting hold, getting, getting hold of the body, getting the JSON out of the body, and um, unmarshalling it, and, and unpacking the JSON, basically, unpacking the body. Um, the other thing is that because, for reasons which I'll get back to in a minute, is we inherited this sort of thing where you, these by clauses are just printed out in the output. So that tells you, it's a way of keeping track of what's going on. But it's also more noise. So if you actually look at this, there's only four lines of assertion here, and everything else is support. And, which you have to and what you do is you learn to read over this, but it's, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit tedious. And the other thing with these by clauses is, is they give you noisy success cases. 
And normally what you want in a success case is it just happens, you don't just, it's fine. Don't worry, don't. You only want to see this stuff if there's a problem. So, um, yeah, not my favorite, but as always, you have to look at the context. How do we get there? So it is a complex environment. It's a rather, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, you can't just sort of uh, turn up and start sort of understanding everything tomorrow until you've built up um, a, lot, a certain amount of background. Um, and the other thing with this environment, it's got lots and lots of global state because it's, um, it's a cloud platform. So, you know, there's, there's lots of state in it, even though the pieces might be stateless. Um, it did start as an exploratory project, so they, they, as a spike, if you like, just to see if it was worth the trouble. Um, and they never quite had the time to do the rework, to go back and, and flush it all out. Um, at the time, there were some problems with, this is not so much about the code, but the, the way the, um, the attitude to the integration test, because uh, it has since been fixed, but at the time there was a certain amount of shared infrastructure, so tests te did tend to be a bit flaky, so people tended to ignore them a bit. Um, but the other thing, the thing that some of this, um, the reason for some of this is Concourse CI, which is their, uh, the, the um, build system that they were using. I mean, it has some very nice features, it's, and it's all built on pipelines and stuff, and it lo looks really good. Um, but at least in the version we had, I don't know if anything's changed since then, um, out of the box, it didn't store artifacts and pass them down the line. Um, so what them, that's one of the reasons that you had to, or that they ended up rebuilding the binaries for each stage through the pipeline. Um, now, on the other hand, one of Go's goals is that it compiles really, really quickly. So it's not a big deal, um, but it's just a little bit more noise. And it's also a thing that would make you want to put more stuff in the output rather than pushing it down into a log or something where you didn't have to, uh, you, you only had to look at it if you cared about it. Um, so that's where we were. And of course they were slow and people ignored them and like, what's the point? So if we go back to that, this is where we came from, um, there's a certain amount you can do without turning the world upside down. You know, can we just clean up a bit, please? So the most obvious thing to do was just to um, have one one big assertion, if you like, which is this one. And this, one thing to notice about it is we now have to have a name. It's not a, it's a bit of text to describe this thing. And then you have all the details. You just hang on to the response and do all your checking at once. And then clearly, um, if you do something once instead of 10 times, it gets a bit faster. Um, so that was easy. And, and also, um, it did actually make things a bit more readable, a bit more compact. And then the other thing to do in the test code, if you remember that messy assertion, was just to do a bit of refactoring, old school refactoring, and tease things out into method names, in, into helper functions. So here you'll see we're hanging on to the update response so we can use it. You do a check there. And then if you remember all that JSON unpacking, 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 that's buried in this, in this operation data from update response. Um, so get that out of the, out of the assertion bit. And it turned out that when we did that, um, it was actually being, that little chunk of code was being used six times. So again, you get um, at least a comprehension speed up and a little bit more description just by removing duplication. You know, so this is not magic. Um, the great thing about almost all of this talk is it's not magic. Um, just have to do it. Um, so guess what? You have to refactor test code. Um, and the sort of things you're looking for, as always, are commonality but also a way of explaining what's going on so that when you read it, you, you, at least if you know the domain, you have a sense of what, what, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so we got that far, and we were sort of chipping away at it. But we did kind of reach the limits, or at least I did. Um, I thought it was time for an experiment. What, there are a number of reasons. One was I was really struggling with this before, just before flow. And... Um, it was very difficult to get to move anywhere from there incrementally, which is the thing you like to do is goes to go incrementally, but sometimes it's actually really quite hard and maybe not quite worth the effort. Um, and the other part, and, and the other thing that if you remember all that 
subshelling and stuff, one of the things that does is it means that sequence imp is important because you have to set that up before you do anything else. So you can't, you know, you fiddle with that sequence at your, at your peril, uh, the risk of breaking everything. The other thing I certainly found is uh, I find it very hard to rethink clearly from this code because it's such a strong opinion <coughs> that it was hard to sort of go anywhere else. Um, and I did want to try a couple of experiments. One was to, you know, to see if we could make a better world. One was to try, one was to build up from first principles. Um, and, uh, you know, to see what, see what actually came out. Um, and the other thing was, was that made it uh, plausible was that, if we can get, you know, people to agree, was that it was actually an easy thing to do without bothering everyone because we could just create a parallel integration test structure leave the old one, we don't have to break anything, it's fine, um, and just go off and do this experiment. And we have, in fact, we ended up doing it on a branch, um, and then decide what to do about it afterwards, rather than bringing the whole team to a halt. So that was a nice sort of position to be in. And then I had some sort of secret implicit goals. Always good to have secret goals. Um, I wanted to play around with, uh, or think about using expressive code to describe the domain not the implementation of the domain. Um, I wanted to push, and, you know, again, this is quite appropriate after, the la after Michael's talk, composability, the idea that pieces, pieces are plugged together. And I wanted to get there by refactoring. I, I generally find that when I sit in a corner and think great thoughts and come up with a perfect design, that I get it wrong. So I try not to do that more than I have to. Right. So now we jump into code. So deep breath. Relax. I'm not sure how much of this you can see from the back anyway, but let, let's, let's see how far we go. So here's a bit of pseudocode that's basically, so start with the pseudocode. Um, we want to start the broker and stop the broker before and after. That's kind of straightforward. Set up a bunch of the broker and a, a bunch of stuff around it or its collaborators. Request a new binding. So you bind a service to an application instance. So we, we're going to request a new binding. And then we get the response, and we make sure that, the, um, that we get the right response and that it's reported appropriately. So that's our, our goal. And then you start to do it. Um, and so what you do is you, you work through this incrementally, taking each step in the pseudocode and replacing it with real code, doing things like compiling a set of uh, collaborators. As we were working our way through this and spotting duplication and noise, uh, we ended up extracting some types to represent players in the test, things like a, a Bosch type, a Cloud Foundry type, and this sort of stuff. One thing that points to, I'll keep coming back to, is that these are players from, or types from the test point of view. These are not production types. Um, so the broker is a good example because this is actually something in the test that talks to a broker. It's not an implementation of the broker. So the, there's a, we're actually in a different domain. Um, and we ended up still using a lot of the uh, support code, particularly around things like fake objects and the, the stub thing, because it, it wasn't the most interesting bit, and one day we could replace them if we felt like it. Um, so if you remember all that stacky stuff, um, this is... So this, this, this takes a while, but then you get somewhere, and this is kind of how it looks. And a lot of this... I'll walk this through in a second, but a lot of this is about pushing the detail out of the test so you can focus on what you care about. What do we do? We create a new broker environment, making sure, remembering, defer, this is our, tr this is try, the equivalent to try finally. So it says, finally, close it afterwards. We tell our service adapter that, to return a binding. And we, then we start our environment. We do this first because, because of the shell thing. We tell our fake Bosch to return a deployment. We get a response to a creation request. And then we, we do some expectations, and then we check the logging, and then we do some verif just clean up verify. Um, so the response to um, function hides all that noise that we saw before. It's all buried down below. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want to see that stuff. Um, we came, we did, we, and we sort of wrote several tests around this sort of space and then sort of looked, looked for the commonalities. Um, and this is part of this is waiting for the duplication to appear before you 
to start to do the refactoring. Um, and in fact, what's not in the slides, the secret is that we actually, well, I went off on a bit of a bender with some premature abstraction that we had to roll back. Um, it was a, shall we say, it's a useful experiment to get a bit of feel for the space. Um, that's my story. I'm going to stick to that. Um, but you, you see that we, we have, um, we started to have uh, structure around the, the structure of the test, if you like. So here's a broker environment. What's a broker environment? It's a broker object or a, a broker thing and it's immediate collaborators. And what can you do with one of these? You can start it, you can verify it, you can close and you can get creation requests and some other bits and pieces. Um, so this gives you a context and where to, where to if you like, that, that you're working in. Um, and it gives you somewhere to delegate behavior to. Um, and if we're talking about hiding detail in the domain types, this is actually, this one came out quite well. In fact, the broker environment used to be called the broker, and then we realized that the broker has to contain a broker, so it became a broker environment, because we needed the name. Um, and you see, it doesn't actually have a broker in it. It actually uh, controls a, a session that gets started. Um, and what can you do with a broker? You can start it, you can close it, and you can check that it's logged something. Um, but there's an interesting, I mean, all of this is standard information hiding, but there's an interesting little subtlety in here. So one is, again, uh, go error handling, just bury that in the constructor, in the factory method, factory function, factory function. Um, I don't want to see that. But we added the port later, because having started sequential, uh, we wanted to go start to run these things in parallel, and you know, you need ports and things. And the nice thing about this is you can see this Ginkgo parallel node, which is you know, a nice way of doing it for us, um, is that we introduced this later without changing the test code at all. Standard information hiding, are you running in parallel? It's not the problem of the test. It's, it's buried in here. So we were able to go parallel without changing any of the test code. Again, not, not, um, not a, it's not rocket science, it's just, you just have to do it. Um, so we wrote a few basic tests just to explore the space and give us a, 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 a foot in the door. Um, the, you start with the basic success case and then a more complex success cases and then you throw in a few, a couple of failure cases to make sure that you've got, you, you, can, you can detect those as well. Um, so we're pottering along doing this and then we decided to uh, p push much harder on the refactoring before I did. Um, and I'll show you in a minute where we ended up. And what you'll see is that it's quite a jump from where we started. Um, and that sometimes that happens, but... And I'm going to have to get move on with this. So this is how it ended up. What have we got here? This is actually the same test. It binds the service when creating a new binding with no cred. Cred hub is a credentials hub, this is an uh, authentication thing. Uh, when uh, the with, there's no serv uh, service adapter returns a binding, so that's our stubby bit. Bosch has VMs for service instance, that's more stubby bits. And then the broker responds with those responses and logs that bit of string, that bit of text. That's the whole test at this level. Um, and you know, we got there little by little. And I'll just walk through some of the pieces because we're running a little late. Um, so the first thing, here's our triggering event. Um, it's actually, most, this bit is mostly sugar, syntactic sugar. Um, so we declare a requestifier, which is a thing that turns a broker environment, and given a broker environment gives you a request uh, that you can send. The when function is actually just sugar. It's just there to make it read a bit better and also to enforce the requestifier type. And you can see, well, if you, or you can, at least the people at the front can see, you create, create new binding, given an environment, returns a create binding request, uh, you know. So that's a nice, nice little sort of, nice little chunk. Um, and you'll notice that if you look at the top, that the names are designed to fit into a sentence. So we're building a little domain language here. So what that gets you is I've got a requestifier with the next bit. You can see this is standard builder chainy things. So with some conditions here, this is some setup. And what the with clause 
does is gathers, gathers up some detail that we'll need for setting up the test and adds it to a request, uh, binds it up with a requester file. There's one nice bit, particularly nice bit in Go, is that you can extend, a, uh, you can add methods to a type um, in, in different files. So what we're doing is we're attaching a with func uh, method to our requester file, which is another reason for putting an actual type in there. So it gives you somewhere to hang stuff, for the compiler to hang stuff. And we just gather up. So the test setup, if you like, if the broker environment is the broker and its collaborators, the test is all the sort of um, runtime context, if you like, for um, a, particular, a particular test. And you notice that a couple of these are actually functions. They're like callbacks um, because um, you have to be able to control when things happen. So they can't be values at this point. And there are these three conditions that we pass in. No cred hub is a null object. Um, we tell the service adapter to return a binding. And then there's this other stuff about setting up some Bosch stuff. stuff. Um, but the thing about this is, is that the names describe the functionality. So now we've got smaller chunks. We can give them names that tell us what to, what to do. And you'll see that we, we reuse them in different, in different places. So now we've got a test set up, and we call this method called the broker, which is not a usual name for a method, but it's part of like having this little language. So in this case, the broker thing, and there are some checks. So we've got a couple of checkers. We, we check the response, and we check the logs. But if you remember way, way, way back when we're that first version of this test, this is the body of the test. We create a, an environment, remember to close it. Uh, we set up the service adapter. We start the environment. We do some more setup. And then we get the response back and check it. And we check the logs, and then we're done. Um, so this is done once, exactly once, in all the code. So this is part of removing duplication. Um, and you know it's reasonably straightforward. Um, and the checkers are, are, are little functions that make assertions about the results. Um, and if you remember this bit, we have to call this service adapter bit first before we start the environment because of the subshell business that we, we had before. Um, and so here's the response checker. It says, um, given a response, make some expectations on it. The curious thing about this, for people who are not used to it, is it's a function returning a function. It's actually a closure. And again, this is like Michael's talk. This is one of those things is, can you, are you used to this or not? Um, the log checker is just the same. You see that, um, yeah, much the same. Um, but you notice that this, all this is doing is delegating the activity down to the, the real work down to our broker object in the environment. So if you like, this is glue between um, uh, one of our sort of domain objects and then the actual test itself. So we put all these together and we get back to our test. And here's another one. And this is a failure because there's no cred hub, no service adapter, and we've got no VMs. So we expect to see an error. 15. <laughs> My glasses. These are short glasses. These are reading glasses. Uh, God. This happens to Yeah, yeah. This happens to you. Um, oh, actually, I lost me thread down. All right, try again. So you notice, actually, we're starting to reuse pieces. Um, you know, we've got, we've got the, the brokers, the bits the same, and the create new bindings the same. Um, but now we can write a new test with a small change. Um, and then here's another one. This is slightly more complicated. Now we do have a credentials hub. Um, so we create one up there. And we want to do some different, um, uh, some different stubby things. Uh, but that depends on the cred hub. So ooh, we use a, um, again, we can create the, the function locally. It's like, again, it's like a little closure. And then we can pass it in, and you see that everything else is much the same. So you can start to see that we, we, by teasing everything apart into little bits and pieces, you can build, um, you can build a, you, you start to get a multiplication effect. 
Um, there's some other nice bits. Oh, so one of the things about this is because this credit hub is we don't need it that often, we can put it local to this test. It doesn't need to drift out into the into the uh, the main body of the code. Fundamental event flow is the same. It's always the same. It's this dot the broker that doesn't change. Um, and the other thing is, you when when the code is this small, you can see the differences um, because you're just focusing on the bit that's relevant in, e in each case. And then there's this bit about um, because we're using functions or closures, is that um, that gives you flexibility over when stuff happens, over when you say something, when you talk about something as to when it happens. And in theory, if we decided we didn't like this little language, we could change all these or put them in a different order because it's actually, when things are called, is actually controlled in the broker, not necessarily up at this level. So that gives you a lot more flexibility. So what do we get out of this? We get compact tests in domain terminology. Um, a bit more declarative, less, I mean, you squeeze all the implementation detail out. Um, if you have static typing, well, let's, like we do in this language, let's use that to help us define our relationships, relationships between the parts. We get extensibility and composability because here's our, well, you can see the composability as we bolt these things together, and here's our extensibility is uh, we can create uh, a new condition or a new setup and pop it in uh, without changing any of this infrastructure. Um, the core behavior is implemented exactly once. That's just good old refactoring. Um, and it doesn't overwork the test framework, which I'll get to in a second. So one of the things about, if you think about it, is Ginkgo, which is a fine test framework, and not, no, no complaints about that. Um, but that's about the domain of testing. Um, not about the domain of testing your system. And there's actually, uh, if you like, there's, there's this, this, I don't want to call it a hierarchy, but there's this range of different domains. There's a domain of testing in general. There's domain of the features of your system. There's the test roles, like all that, that the broker objects and things. Um, there's the system drivers, that how do you actually make a, thing happen in the system and then there's the system itself and in principle if you're writing enough if your thing is big enough each of these you probably want a slightly different um, uh, terminology for each one of these each, each one of these has its own little language if you like um, and talking about prehistory I mean this is this is the thing about going all the way back to Lisp is Lisp is the, the way you program Lisp is you build a language to describe your problem and then you then you implement your problem um, but the, one, of the, one of the tricks with all of this stuff is to look, look for vocabulary and see if you've got sudden shifts in vocabulary. So if you go all the way back, if you think you're, you're about asserting stuff about a response and you find yourself unpacking bits of JSON, you've got a, or un, uh, checking for streaming errors, 10, 10, um, then you've got, you've got mixed, mixed vocabulary there. So that, that, to me, that's always a clue, is, is looking for the, the, you know, if I start finding that, I mean, it's all right as a sort of interim stage, but that's one of the places to look for seams, if you like, in, in the code or uh, um, inconsistencies. Uh, it requires a little bit of effort. Um, it does take time to refactor out the common behavior, but we're all software crafty people, so we believe that's a good idea, right? Um, and I, I generally find it does pay off. Um, it does require a commitment to get the names right. Um, I'm constantly amazed at the payoff, or regularly amazed at the payoff you get from when you take the time to argue about the names. Um, this doesn't make me very popular, but uh, it does make the code read better. And then in this case, it does require familiarity with function passing, composition, that kind of stuff, which is not that much in the Go House style. Um, other languages, it's, it's more familiar. So anyway, we, we, like I say, we went off on a, uh, mostly Winner and I went off on a bit, bit of a bender. Um, and then we had a meeting where we sort of present, a session where we presented this back to the team. And so if you imagine you're coming from to that, 
Uh, they're going, where's my code gone? Um, uh, so, and you know, they, were, they, they took it quite well considering. Uh, but they did like some things. They liked the way the style reduced the noise um, and let you read the essence of the test quickly. So that, that was a good thing. Um, they liked the idea of moving from global state to local because the global state was just a nightmare uh, when you're actually trying to debug anything. Um, they liked the fact that it quietened down some of the Ginkgo noise um, because we were basically overusing Ginkgo. And they like the, the better use of expressive matches. So it turns out that GoMega, uh, which is the matcher library, is actually quite a good matcher library. And it's pretty easy to write your own matches and to combine and compose them together, which is what you, you would hope for from a matcher library. Um, and some of the noise that went away was by, rather than having multi multi multiple ex expects, is having one big expect with multiple clauses in it. Um, and then you fed in the, fed in the, um, the value that you were checking. Um, so that, that did make stuff a bit more compact and a bit, bit easier to see. Um, but these are traditional uh, differences. Um, because going declarative doesn't really suit everybody. Um, you know, that, that's, just a, that's just a fact. Um, so the in, and one of the big problems you find is, is that all of a sudden everything's indirect. So that there's, um, as we were, I don't know who was on this side was, was saying earlier, I mean, one of the premises of, of Go, of the, the design of Go, is that uh, for loops are easier to understand because it's, um, we may or may not choose to agree with that, but that's, 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 that's the house style. Um, and so a lot of this work was, it was very different from Go and Ginkgo conventional, uh, the conventional approach. And one of the things they were concerned about, which is, again, not, you know, quite reasonable, is that um, they, they had rotation between different teams. So people would move around every few months. And they were concerned about the learning curve for new team members who would come up across from a more conventional pro, uh, project. And then they look at this, and then they, you know, they, they lose a lot of time just trying to understand what the hell is going on in this test. So they resolved multiple things. Um, but this happened after I left because I was only there for a short term. Um, things like local mutable test setup, avoid the just before each and reduce the before each. Um, don't do this tiny granular um, assertions. Um, I mean, it's, I can just about see the argument for it if you're doing unit tests. I don't like it, but I can, I can understand why people want to do that. But for integration tests, that just doesn't, that's, just doesn't work. Um, don't reinvent GoMega, uh, which means that you know, use the features in GoMega because it's actually quite, has some quite nice bits and pieces. Um, the thing about don't repeat Ginkgo was the Ginkgo has features like um, you can do table tests in Ginkgo. So don't write the test five times when you can make it a table test, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so there's something in there about um, learning the tooling because these aren't big frameworks. I mean, you know, it's not like large framework of your choice. They're not, um, they're, they're uh, more like libraries than frameworks. So that, you know, it, it, you'd, if you just stick to the, um, you know, the thing that's on the front page of the, uh, of the website, the, the, the simple examples on the front page, then you're missing opportunities. And then lastly uh, is to put, and you can't see at the back, um, is to focus on what you're trying to achieve. Five, right, thank you. Um, rather than the steps uh, uh, um, you need to go through to achieve it. So lessons learned. Uh, one, keep your tests under control, even in a prototype, um, because if you don't, you go slow. I, either they're a waste of time and they just drag you down, or you pay attention to them and they drag you down, and um, whatever. And so it's better to either fix them or delete them, um, or do something else, because even when you're, when you're thinking in a hurry and you've got a, a suite of really flaky, slow tests, that doesn't make you go faster. And there are other, other responses to that. Um, this is kind of the opposite, but, which is to extract structure into your test code. Um, don't do everything in the framework. Um, and that's a, about the domain -y thing, is, is that you have multiple domains even on the test side. So it's good to keep those clear because then, then you can, um, it's easy to understand the result. Um, one is, do the experiment if you have a strong idea. 
so a lot of places, I mean, one of the agile failure modes is that it turns into this feature production line, you know. I'm not typing in code of value to the user right now, therefore we're all going to die, you know. And um, that's not necessarily the best way to approach. I mean, there are times when you have to do that, but there are also times when if you have an idea, do the experiment and find out if it's true or not, and then maybe you'll learn something. Or maybe it'll take you to somewhere better. And then one more thing, or two more things. Sometimes you have to roll back for consensus. Um, we are actually working in, well, for those, those of us who, who, whose formative experience in small talk, everything else is a disappointment. So <laughs> we have to live with the local, the local situation. Um, which goes to the next point, which is you can do it in your language. I mean, I've done test-driven stuff in Bash and all sorts of stuff, and, and it's amazing how far you can get. Um, you may not want to keep it, but it's worth, again, like the experiment says, it's worth pushing the boundaries from time to time. Um, but the language culture does matter because unless you're on your own. There we go. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> One from this troublemaker in the corner. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. So the times I've kind of gone in a direction like this, I've always kind of hoped to basically find code that would move from one domain to another. Did you find anything in a testing domain that you felt might um, move back into production? Oh, not in this case, but I have seen that before. And it's, to me, it's one of the, it's the line I use about test-driven is, is that you know your test-driven stuff is going really, really well when a concept that appeared in the tests floats across the line into the production code. But it, it didn't happen in this case because this was mostly a rewrite. Oh, somewhere, yeah. So that's a quick question. What was the time span for that feature to happen? Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks or something. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge amount, maybe two to three. I can't, I can't quite remember. Yeah, I <clears throat> I'm coming from different frameworks and stuff, but uh, I think the, the question is still the same. Uh, wh what I have experienced is when you group together like lots of assertions in the beginning you have like 10 assertions per thing. It's very easy to see what did not happen. Yeah. And here you have one big assert and says assert that the thing didn't happen. So what went wrong? Was it the HTTP 202 that didn't happen? Was it like the serialization that went wrong? What's your experience with that? Because I, I think when the tests are green, it's okay, right? But if it's red, what did not go right? Um, so usually because so a couple of things. One is the thing that failed, will, you hope it will tell you what failed, which particular piece of the thing, you know, the status code or whatever it is that failed. So you, it's not like, oh my God, nothing worked. But, but it, do you, you have hang, a... Hang, hang, hang. Sorry. Just, yeah. Let me finish that. Yeah. And... Um, sorry, so... And I'm, I'm quite happy with the... Um, just stop on the first thing. Um, other people don't like it, but, you know, make your choice. Um, and the other thing is I don't regard the test output as, I use the test output with the code. It's not like I'm an end user and I get this error message and I, I can't look at it again. So when I get one of these failures, I take the first thing and then I go and look at the code. So, and I try and structure it so that whenever, whatever it is that's failed will tell me what has failed rather than just no. So, so you still had the assertions on the HTTP code as well or? Because I didn't, well, I might have missed it. But. Uh, it'll be a number of assertions, one of which will, I mean. Yeah, you, you will have something, I'll explain what. Yeah, what exactly, you know, yeah. it's, it's okay. not just, yeah. no, yeah, yeah okay. certainly not, yeah, okay. that makes sense, that would, that, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Was there another one? Anyone on this side? Okay, thank you. Thank you.